start with Maza here. Uh, my name is Mazahir Saleh, and I'm a city council member at large, and uh, at the same time, I'm the mayor pro tem. So I'm Derek Willard. I'm a retired faculty member from the University of Iowa. And this year, I'm chair of the Riverside Theater Board of Directors. Hi, Adam Knight, a producing artistic director at Riverside Theater. I'm Kate Markham. I'm the development director at Riverside Theater. Eleanor Dilk, city attorney. Susan Mim, city council. John Thomas, city council. Jeff Ruin, city manager. And Wendy Ford, Economic Development Coordinator. And this is about the only time I actually start the meeting off, but um, I'm do, I do that on um, the first meeting of a new Economic Development Committee. And so first of all, I'd like to welcome Mazahir and, and John Thomas to the Economic Development Committee, along with Susan, who's served at least a couple of terms now, I think, mm -hmm. um, on the committee. The first order of business with a new group is to um, organize the committee and choose a chair and I think the first step in doing that would be to uh, entertain a nomination from the group so did you want to continue to serve sure. if, you, happy if you're happy serving I'm happy to have you serve okay <laughs> I guess we have a nomination from John nomination of Susan I second the nomination is that second right yep yeah. okay second the nomination all those in favor Aye. Okay. Motion carries, and Susan will It's all yours. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and next item on the agenda is to consider approval of the minutes from the October 28, 2019 Economic Development Committee meeting. This, this is a little bit awkward because two of our three members were not present for that meeting. Um, I guess probably Wendy and Jeff and I can attest, I think, to the accuracy of those meetings. I've read through them probably in actually more detail than I oftentimes do because I was anticipating this situation. Um, so would entertain a motion for approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Any, do either of you have any questions about them or anything? I don't know. No. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Three zero, approved. Item number four, consider affirmation of the fiscal year 21 budgeted amount and intent to budget fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 financial assistance for Riverside Theater. Wendy, I'll let you start. Yeah, sure. Well, you have a memo in your packet, and um, our guests from our guests here today are from Riverside Theater, as as you note from the introductions. Um, what we've done in the uh, rec most recent years is to have. Uh, uh, our groups come in, like Riverside Theater, who have received funding over um, the past year or years, come in and give us an update on um, the activities, uh, their challenges, what the, what's coming up for the year, and that sort of thing. Um, and then we have the Economic Development Committee affirm that the $20,000, in this case, a year that we budgeted, uh, or this year, that we budgeted for uh, Riverside Theater uh, remain and that um, in the past we have also in, uh, made the intent to budget the same for future years. So, and while that doesn't uh, commit because you can't bind a, a future council to those expenditures, it does help both on the staff side for building a budget and, and also for the organizations who um, who depend on on city funding as well. So. Um, you'll see um, from the packet if, um, there that I have a history of um, the support through the years for Riverside Festival. I'm, or sorry, for the Riverside Theater that <laughs> also includes the production of the uh, Riverside, or of the Shakespeare, Shakespeare Festival at the Riverside Theater. I think that's how it is. <laughs> I may have posted it back and forth. Um, anyway, so without belaboring um, more in my memo, I thought it would be best to have uh, whoever from their group is going to speak, give us um, a little bit of uh, background, talk about what's going on, and then open it up to you for questions. Sounds good. 
Um, well, hi. Thanks so much for welcoming us. Um, it's great to, to meet those of you we haven't met before, and it's great to be back here at the city. Um, Kate Markham is our new development director, um, full-time development director, which is um, a nice uh, step for us as an organization. And she's going to run you through uh, the fiscal year that just ended at the end of August 2019, and also um, what we've budgeted for the current fiscal year, and also what the year-to-date numbers are looking like. Passing around our budgets for your viewing. Um, to just get right into the nitty gritty of it, uh, 2019 fiscal year for us was not the best year that we've had. Um, we had a couple of challenges. Um, you'll see uh, under that 2019 actual column that our subscription and our ticket sales were down pretty significantly from 2018 and um, certainly down from what we had budgeted. Um, it's due to a number of factors we've identified. Part of that is leadership turnover. Um, and it's hard to bounce back from those subscription sales being low, we kind of rely on the subscription sales to float us when we have more challenging productions because we know that those folks are going to come regardless. Um, so those single ticket sales didn't make up for our loss in subscription ticket sales. Uh, you will see also uh, in somewhat good news that our contributed income was up also pretty significantly from 2018. Uh, we've been working really hard on rebuilding relationships with donors in our community and building new relationships with new donors. Um, and our expenses, you'll see, were up, but they were still less than we budgeted. Um, so we ended at a $33,000, almost $34,000 loss. We didn't meet our budgeting marks. We um, had to extend our line of credit. Um, you'll see, though, in the next column over our 2020 budget, we really went on a deep dive and we adjusted those numbers um, to be attainable. And you'll see that they're very comparable to the 2018 budget. Um, we're projecting a return to the 2018 levels due to the stability of our new leadership um, and the addition of a full-time development director. Um, if you go to the next page, this is our actuals for um, our, our fiscal year to date, uh, which started in September. Um, this is this is the good news. This is great. Um, our subscription sales and our general ticket sales are up. Um, the agitators, our current show that just opened on Friday, is currently outperforming its own projections. Um, we are also eight thousand dollars above budget for contributed income. We had a really successful um, year-end campaign. Um, we're eighteen thousand dollars over plan for contributed income through December. Um, Due to, we added show sponsors. There are show sponsors for each individual production now. We've worked really hard on kind of pairing sponsors with the content of the shows. So for the agitators, um, a couple of our sponsors are Jim Leach and Vicki Lansing. Um, you know, common interests, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. Um, and we've also got S Hills Bank to underwrite our student tickets. Um, our student tickets are only $10. Uh, and they're not subsidized in any form until the Hills Bank sponsorship. Um, our average ticket price is $30. So us offering those $10 student tickets puts us in a little bit of a crunch, but it's, it's worth it. It's part of our mission to get more students and young folks in the door and be an accessible arts um, venue. Um, so I guess our key takeaways for you with all these numbers is that uh, we have adjusted our budget. We're budgeting well. Um, our contributed and earned income is up this fiscal year. Um, cash flow does remain an issue. Uh, we don't have any assets or savings that we can dip into when we have losses. Um, so it's pretty critical for us to hit our marks. Um, you'll see, too, that we're anticipating a $10,000 surplus next year, which we'll then use to kind of pay down some of our long-term debt. And we only project that to get better for next year. Um, one of the uh, things we wanted to do is update you on um, what's happening at Riverside. Uh, the, you all have this page also. It kind of is an update from the uh, information that's in your packet. Uh, one of the things, um, for those of you who don't know, um, up until our, uh, up and through our 35th season, um, Riverside was um, led by our founders. And, and over the last four years, we've been transitioning from a founder-driven institution to a mission-driven one. 
And uh, one of the things that Kate alluded to was that, that turnover, not only in staff, but also in artistic leadership. And a big part of my coming in has been to uh, rebuild that trust in our programming. And that's why subscription sales uh, still remain so important to us, because our mission is to provide challenging work. And if we don't have that kind of buffer, uh, all of a sudden, if a play is unfamiliar, um, we don't have that kind of guarantee that uh, our audiences are going to come along. I guess on one level, uh, we need to be doing plays that people want to see. Um, but on another level, it's our mission to be challenging our audiences. And, um, and so riding that line is always so key for an institution like ours. Um, one of the highlights I wanted to point out is representation on our stages. Um, a big uh, part of my coming in has been uh, making sure that um, Riverside is always asking ourselves um, what stories we're telling and who gets to tell them. Uh, three of the eight plays this year were written by women. Um, that may not sound like a huge stride, but that's um, keeping pace with last season, and that's um, above the national average, which is one in five. Uh, two playwrights of color on our stages this year. Um, I think that may be for the first time ever in Riverside's history. Um, we have 29% um, actors of color this year. Uh, that's up from 23% last year and a really big increase from 6% two years ago. Um, uh, as far as we can tell in the latest uh, um, uh, info we've got about Johnson County, um, Johnson County is about 23% non-white, and we want to make sure that we're at least keeping that as a benchmark on our stage. Um, also, uh, as of this weekend, it's looking like this summer we're going to program our first um, all-black cast on um, Riverside stage ever. Um, I guess unless you count a one-person show. Um, this is a four-person play, and we're just really thrilled about that. Um, it's Skeleton Crew by Dominique Morisseau, and that's tentatively scheduled for this July 2020. Another big part of our mission is connecting artists and audiences. Um, we've had three, we will have had three playwrights in residence this year. Megan Gogarty for Feast, she was the writer performer. Matt Smart, who wrote The Agitators, which is currently running, which is the story of the friendship between Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony. That playwright is coming into town next weekend and we'll have talkbacks with the audience. And also David Lee Nelson, who's the writer performer of Stages, will be coming into town in March. Um, we have two high school matinees of The Agitators, uh, so students are being bussed in during their school day to see the agitators. Those performances are being underwritten by the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. Uh, and we're hoping to add uh, one or two more student matinees of the agitators. And we've had three talkbacks for straight white men and, and we have four scheduled talkbacks for the agitators. So it's continuing our mission to not only be providing great plays, but also be providing opportunities for our audiences to connect with the artists and the makers of these plays. Uh, for those of you who may be um, slightly unfamiliar with Riverside and what, what makes us special. We're the only professional theater in Iowa City um, and one of only two in Eastern Iowa. What that means is that we pay all of our artists. So Theater Cedar Rapids may be presenting high quality theater on a somewhat regular basis, but it's all volunteer labor. Um, we have, uh, we will have 50 actor contracts in 2019, 2020 for a total of 308 work weeks. So that's 308 weeks in which actors are being paid to do their work. An additional 40 contracts will be um, put out this year for designers, directors, and crew. No one works on our stage without getting paid. Um, as a part of our mission to be providing an artistic home for regional theater professionals, um, we're increasing the number of equity contracts on our stage. Actors' Equity Association is the National Labor Union of Stage Actors. Um, last year we had four equity contracts, this year we're going to have eight. Uh, so that's providing that kind of web of support in this ecosystem for artists being compensated for their work. Uh, we've ha we are building partnerships in the area. Um, we've already partnered with the Iowa City Book Festival, Witching Hour Festival. Um, Iowa Writers House is housing our writer performer for stages. Um, Mission Creek Festival is having a lit reading on our stage. We've already had panel discussions with the International Writing Program and the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. Um, Miriam Gilbert um, every year teaches a senior class um, on the Shakespeare show that we do. This year she's adding Ibsen's Doll's House 
to coincide with programming um, because we're doing A Doll's House Part 2 on our stage in April. And also for Stages, which is our next play, which is um, the story, autobiographical story, of uh, a man who at 39 gets diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer. We're partnering with the American Cancer Society on that. Um, a portion of ticket sales will be going towards the American Cancer Society. And we're meeting uh, tomorrow, actually, with the Holden Cancer Research Center um, to work with them on, on ways to uh, build, build a community for this play. Um, on the next page, you'll see uh, we've had a goal of increasing um, student attendance to get to 10% attendance, uh, up from 7% last year. We're currently at 17% um, through the first three productions. That's kind of a, a little bit of a double-edged sword because it does, because those tickets are heavily discounted. But um, it's great to have that kind of new energy in our theater. And if we can keep those numbers up, uh, that'll be great. Um, one thing that was highlighted before, but I want to highlight again, is free Shakespeare. This is only our third year making it free, so it remains a little a risky proposition for us. And we're continuing to try to build corporate sponsorship for that and local businesses and local individuals who believe in that work. Um, based on the success of the last two years, we're adding a third week to Free Shakespeare. Um, we don't think we've hit the ceiling yet of what that programming can do. And in some ways, that's the other end of Riverside's mission. Not only are we trying to provide professional, serious-minded theater in the heart of downtown, but we're also trying to make professional theater accessible to all in Johnson County. And so um, we love uh, being on the festival stage. We love using that space. It was sad to me last year that we only used it for two weeks. And so I hope that this um, is, a, is a long longer pattern of making use of that space and bringing um, Iowa City residents into the park. This is all building towards our 40th anniversary season. Riverside is one of the oldest not-for-profits in the city, and we're really proud of that. Um, it's going to be, hopefully, a, a great celebration. Uh, we're going to be bringing in um, past uh, artists uh, who've worked for us um, and hopefully kind of be looking backwards and also looking forwards. We're going to be reviving our Walking the Wire series, which highlights local um, artists and performers. Um, and and including, of course, a world premiere and regional premieres, in our, which is part of our mission. So uh, we feel like this current season um, and the numbers that we're seeing, it's really setting the stage for next year to be um, a success. And we're really uh, grateful to the city for its continued partnership in making that happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything from either of the other two? Like to add. I can jump in on that and just to say how grateful we are for uh, city support. Uh, not just the financial support is key to us because as you see by the um, uh, budgets here, uh, ticket revenue is at its best, only about half of, of what we need. And for the rest, we uh, come to uh, individual donors, but also uh, foundations and, um, and, and to the city. But more than the financial support is the support we have by presenting what we do to you, getting your review of this, uh, the feedback that we get from you, from, from the government, and, and from your, uh, for your support here. So we're extremely grateful for this relationship that we have with the city of Iowa City. And as I, I can say as a resident and, of course, as a board member, um, I really appreciate having a destination a downtown, in the downtown Iowa City, in particular, particularly over in the north side where we are, uh, we f find that we think we're a tremendous contributing member to the um, uh, revamp that we're having of the downtown area. And I'm extremely grateful as a citizen that that is happening and that we're contributing to it. So thank you. Thank you for this. Um, I would just like to kind of and tack on to that as a citizen. I just moved back here in October from Chicago, and um, when I learned that Riverside got support from the city, I was just really overwhelmed, and it just kind of reaffirmed my choice to move back here and make a home for my family, um, that, that this is such a wonderful city to live in and that there's so much support throughout the community and like with the city government um, that makes us a really lovely place to live. Good. Well, thank you all three. I, I would just like to say, I, 
I really appreciate not only the numbers, because I am a numbers person, but also um, this summary. I think this just speaks so highly to the things that you're doing, um, you know, the representation, um, connecting the artists. I like the idea that you're bringing in high school students for the matinees um, during their school day. So it's, it, you know, you have kind of a captive audience, but it's, it, it's easier for them to get there when it's being organized for them. Um, I would say from the city's perspective, what we continue to look at in our support of the nonprofits is, I, to me, two really primary things. One, um, it brings a quality of life to this community um, in terms of particularly the arts and culture uh, organizations that we support. And it also, your organization along with others are economic drivers also for this community. I mean, I don't see it here, but and you may or may not have it, but a lot of places now start looking like at credit card um, uh, zip codes, et cetera, to kind of determine, you know, where their audience is coming from. And I'm sure that you're having, you know, a lot of people that are coming from outside of Iowa City or even outside of Johnson County. I'm sure a lot of them are staying to eat dinner and, you know, spend money in other ways. So it's, it's quote, the right thing to do in terms of supporting the arts and cultures, but it's also a smart thing to do um, in terms of the economic development. So appreciate um, all your hard work. And, and obviously you've, um, I think as you kind of alluded to, Adam, there's been some challenges as you've moved from a founder organization to new leadership and mission-driven, and it looks like it's all kind of headed up. So thank you. So other questions or comments? From yeah, I have some questions here. For me, as uh, only eight years, I don't know if that's too much, a lot or not, eight years resident of Iowa City, and not knowing a lot about the River Theater, that's concerned me, you know, because I think um, I, I, I start knowing about the, the Riverside Theaters during my campaign. Because I just met like some of the founders, and they, you know, I start knowing about it. And uh, but before that, I'd have n I have I just see here there is many good stuff that you guys do for the public, free event that you do it in the public park and a lot of things. And you talked about how your actors diverse being like increased from six to twenty three. It's huge. But can you tell me a little bit about your audience? Who's the audience? Um, our, I mean, the 17% student number is a really promising number for us, but our audience is overwhelmingly old and white. Um, this is not a Riverside-centric um, problem. This is an industry problem. Um, if you, uh, almost every theater in America is very concerned about that. And um, I think it, uh, it is due to a lot of factors, but on a certain level, it's due to the types of stories we've been telling. Um, we bringing in writers of color is an important driver for me to to adding um, to building an audience for this kind of theater. Um, but also, Riverside has not been doing a great job at outreach. Um, That's what I want to talk about. I, outreach, you know, since uh, you know, I, this is not like saying I'm not agreeing for the but you know the the money that being budget for you or anything. I encourage those kind of things, mm -hmm. and I'm very supportive of it. The only thing is, I think this is taxpayer money of the whole Iowa City resident, not only white people. You know, and I think we need to have. Uh, you are doing great by bringing like writer from different colors by having more actors even come there. I know you are doing great on doing that from the report, but how people like me can know there's something like this going on. And that's part why I think Free Shakespeare is such an important um, keystone to what we're talking about, because that's an opportunity for us to um, reach out to pockets of the community who, for whatever reason, either don't know about Riverside or um, maybe have economic obstacles to coming. And so by making it free over the last two years, um, those numbers um, are on the whole, more diverse than the numbers coming to Gilbert Street. Mm -hmm. And um, by letting them know that this great theater is happening, uh, it, it increases our chances of building an audience for that. But you're absolutely right. We need to be doing better. I see Free Shakespeare as our entry point to reaching more corners of the community. Sure. Yeah, just hopefully, you know, we can increase the outreach. So, uh, 
some people like can come bring their kids or mm-hmm. encourage their students to come, students of color. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's, it's just a matter of knowing if there is something going on in Iowa. Mm-hmm. Yes, in Iowa City, so we can come. Mm-hmm. I, I, but this is great, and I'm one of the people who's gonna tell a lot of people about it, so they can come and you know attend this kind of event because it's really nice event going on there. But it's just a matter of people don't know about it, mm-hmm. and yes. hopefully next time we're gonna hear uh, like uh, you are increasing your outreach and increasing more like audience that they never been there before. Yeah, yes. thank you. Yeah, I would, I would share both. Susan and Maz, Mazahir's comments and, and say that, I mean, this past year personally uh, was, I, I attended four or will be attending four of your plays and it, it, I think the diversity, the, you know, kind of modernization, if you will, of, of theater, you know, where the men in boats, I think all the characters were women, correct, mm-hmm. as I recall. <laughs> so, I mean, it was these, these inversions of what one's expectation of theater might be, which I think does have perhaps the image of being kind of an old-fashioned mm-hmm. art form. Uh, so, you know, to the degree you are making it more contemporary, bringing in greater diversity uh, into your, you know, your programming, you're reaching out. I think there's also, I think, a tendency to, for institutions of all kinds. I mean, we just went through the aid to agencies and, and their presentation, you know, uh, human services, their presentation was in how they tried to, if, if you look at them in their entirety, they provide this full range of services. Mm-hmm. So that notion of safety net is actually made up of many entities. Um, but oftentimes these agencies may silo themselves and I think and that, I think, applies to the arts community as well. So I, I like the idea that you are reaching out in various ways, both for financial sponsorship as well as to the high schools. I, one of my memories of high school was we uh, brought in a poet. That's one of my lasting memories of being in high school, frankly, was this guest poet who came to our high school. So. Yeah, reaching out, integrating with other arts organizations um, and cultural organizations, all of that I think is a very positive direction. I hadn't appreciated this notion of founder versus mission and I, I can understand how that must be an enormous challenge to, to make that transition. Um, but I, I do think, you know, in, in looking at your summary material that there are a lot of I think very positive and encouraging directions that Riverside is going. Thank you. Um, to some of those points, um, we're trying to play a long game mm-hmm. and and learn from some of our mistakes. Last winter, we presented um, the first August Wilson play ever on Riverside stage. It was a one-man show, and attendance was not great. Okay. And so it taught us that it's not an if you build it, they will come situation. Riverside has not developed um, trusting relationships with some pockets of our community and we have to work on that and so it can't just be a one thing every two or three years and expect um, audiences who've never come through our doors to come in we have to be programming these kind of things every season and building relationships okay. and I think to, to Maz and John's point too you talk about typically in the industry the audience is older white people and at some point, we're all going to die off. <laughs> so, you know, looking for that. <laughs> we have, as somebody today said to me, we have a shelf life. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, to be to be playing that to be playing that long game, you know, who who is going to be your audience in five or ten or fifteen years, as that sixty to eighty percent of your current audience is no longer able to get to the theater. Right. And so. Um, making it something. I mean, I lived in a rural area growing up. I never went to theater in high school. Oh. Never had the opportunity. I mean, it just wasn't. I mean, grew up on a dairy farm out in the country in Vermont. I mean, it was not in, it was just wasn't in my life. And so there's a lot of people even that live in a city the size of Iowa City for whom that's the same thing. If their parents don't go, they weren't brought up with it, It's they might see the ads in the Press Citizen or hear something on the radio. But again, it's it's not something that they see themselves doing. They haven't ever done it before. They might 
not be comfortable or whatever. And so to find ways, um, and I think through bringing in high school students um, or doing certain events that really invite and welcome in um, people who may not be familiar with theater you know, firsthand will certainly uh, could help with your attendance and also um, kind of help with that long game and, and bringing people in, like Maz is saying, who don't know anything about the theater, have never been to it, maybe haven't really heard about it. I've been through it myself, and I never took my kids somewhere, you know. Right. I guess that means my kids never went to, and I did not, and I have five children here, <laughs> so we can... I, I, yeah, and I think you're headed, uh, really headed in the right direction with lots of opportunities yes. ahead of you. So, hopefully, um, anything else? No. Okay. I think we need a motion then to kind of affirm that um, we will be recommending um, that budget amount and that our intent will be to continue that for the fiscal year 22 and 23. I move to recommend it for fiscal year 22 and 23, same amount. I will second that. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those passes three zero. Well, thank, thank you, you very much thank for you. your time um, and information. Okay. And if there's any way that we can help you in terms of getting that word out, um, let us know. Great. Thank you. Great asset thank for the so community. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we'll move on to staff report. Wendy. Okay. Feel yeah, free to stay. yeah, feel free to stay or go <laughs> as you oh, as you. I shared it with my network. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I just have a couple things to report on as a staff report. Um, we have started, uh, well, we've started and we're at various uh, starting stages on um, our climate action at work programs. And um, one is to begin to get our local businesses to um, sign up for uh, a program called Portfolio Manager, which is uh, essentially an energy and resource use tracking national uh, web-based database. I know that's a mouthful, but what it will help uh, people do is um, understand the metrics and the, of their use in their own building, and it will allow them to compare themselves with other buildings as well, um, both locally and nationally for, for averages. Um, our first business to sign up and start through the process is um, Beadology with Karen Cubby, mm. and she has been gracious enough to have uh, staff people, uh, Brenda Nations and I, in to help learn the Portfolio Manager program so that we can help others um, get signed up and get started on, on this tracking as well. And it's much simpler than I thought it might be. So um, it, it's a lot easier to go out and ask somebody to um, upload information if it's if it's an easy thing to do, and, and this really is. So that's underway. I think our next uh, handhold, handheld customer will be one of the local banks here. They've actually um, shown a big interest in um, in this and have several buildings, as you might imagine. So um, we'll be working with them. And, and then hopefully we'll have enough um, of this under our belt that we'll really feel confident in being able to promote it and help people and, and, and really do a, a bigger splash about it. But we wanted to get good at it first and, and yeah. make sure we understood both the benefits and also the technical aspects of it. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is, um, for several months now, over a year, we've been working on um, some commercial tax abatement areas, essentially um, the surrounding the Highway 1 and 6 corridor, um, excluding existing urban renewal areas, which are slightly different. And as you might imagine, the challenges are um, in describing those areas that um, just encompass commercial properties and then, I mean, legally describing them. Um, and so we're probably about 80, 90 percent uh, through with that. And as soon as we have that um, technical aspect of, of putting a plan together, um, we'll be able uh, with that one to get it out in the public and start it down the legislative process of having a public hearing and notifying by mail all of the people who are in those uh, described areas and then hoping that we can get some um, improvements to buildings that would A, increase the valuation of those buildings by at least 15 percent 
thereby increasing the, the tax base, but also require that they include some kind of uh, um, energy efficiency component in their building plan. And that's, frankly, another sticking point that we're, we're trying to work with. And, um, and we may just only be able to suggest that people do uh, energy efficiency improvements on their buildings since the state law wouldn't doesn't really allow us to mandate that and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that but that's my understanding of the tax abatement areas and and what we can do as far as mandating uh, an energy efficiency component with those more to come on that though and yeah I'm sorry maybe you talked to Sarah in more detail about this but I mean generally I would I would think that would not apply when we're talking about an incentive based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But whether or not we could have, say, a check box on an application that says, yes, I am doing an energy efficiency component to this or not, to that extent is what we're thinking and mm -hmm. building awareness of it. But, uh, and then the third thing was um, that we will be amending. Um, three of our urban renewal areas that have um, the, that are centered over industrial zones that um, also have significant tax increment uh, in that within them that would allow us to uh, create incentives for uh, these industrial buildings to do really significant energy efficiency projects as well. So because buildings are uh, some of the biggest wasters of energy in the community, in fact, I just read somewhere that buildings tend to waste about 30% of the energy that that they're billed for, that just goes out the window or whatever. So we're thinking if we can get some of that corrected that we could help make a dent in the carbon emissions reductions goals that council has on that too. That's all I had. Anything from the committee? No. no. But it's meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Any other business from anybody? Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for having us and thank you. Thank you for coming, yeah. yeah.